Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Harry Miller. He's a veteran of the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force. He's also a combat veteran of World War II, and he served during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. He served a total of 22 years in uniform. And Harry, thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, let's start with the early part of your life. I know you had a, a difficult childhood. Uh, describe that a, a little bit and, and where you grew up. Well, okay, I was born in Columbus, Ohio uh, at the start of the Depression and uh, spent my first 10 years involved with that. And my mother died when I was three. My dad died when I was 12. And I always wanted to be in the Army ever since I was a little kid. And uh, so I got a chance to go in. And I went through by lying about my age when I was 15. How'd that work? Well, it was difficult. Uh, the Army had started a program called the uh, uh, Enlisted Reserve Corps. I don't think it lasted very long. But a man told me about it, and he knew I wanted to go in the Army. And so he told me about it, and I went down and checked into it and said, yeah, you can join. I told him I was 18, and I was getting ready for the draft. And he says, uh, yeah, you can join. He said, you have to have a birth certificate. So I went to get a birth certificate. In those days, they had a, uh, a ledger, and somebody with beautiful handwriting would write the information in there. Well, they couldn't find my birth certificate. So I went back and I told him, I said, they can't find my birth certificate. And he said, well, that's all right, we can let you in anyway. So I went in and took my basic training at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Uh -huh. And uh, there was a lieutenant there, I think his name was Miller as well. And he tried to get me to go into OCS after basic training. And I thought, oh boy, that's all I need, you know, being 15 years old and get caught. <laughs> so I had to put him off. And uh, so I put him off, and, and when the basic training was over, well, I went to uh, uh, Fort Ord, California, to a, in, an amphibious tank battalion. And there they used what they called uh, LVTs, landing craft vehicle, or landing, half, landing craft tracked, that's what they call LVTs. And uh, why they didn't turn around and say track landing vehicle, I don't know. But, <laughs> but anyway, I got all my shots to go to the Pacific. And uh, I thought, I, I really thought that uh, I was gonna go to the Pacific. I, I got shots for elephantitis and sleeping sickness, all kinds of things I'd never heard of. Got through the shot line, they called my name and said, you're supposed to go see this man. So I went to see him and he said, don't unpack, you're going on a trip. So a bunch of them, a bunch of us took uh, these LVTs to to Europe. Well, you may recall through his, if you know about your history, uh, Eisenhower had a lot of trouble getting General Montgomery, the British general, to uh, get the port of Antwerp. Well, he finally got the town, but he couldn't use the fort because the Germans were holding the the uh, Walken Island and the uh, North ba South Bavelan Island or it was a peninsula, that one. And so he used these things to send the Canadians in to take the Germans out of there so that they could run ships in and out of the port. Well, after that, why well, they finally opened the port and uh, by that time, why well, they sent us to what they called REPL depots at the time, replacement depots. They had three army camps at, at uh, La Havre, France, named for cigarettes, Old Gold, Lucky Strike and Pell, uh, and uh, Philip Morse. I went to Old Gold, and from there I was assigned to my unit. And uh, my unit was the 740th Tank Battalion, which was a separate tank battalion. And uh, they were at the town of Neufchateau uh, in Belgium, the town of Neufchateau, about 15 miles east of Liège, Belgium. Well, the funny part of it was when the battalion got to, to Europe, they were, they were uh, in a special top secret program called Canal Defense Light, which, or CDL. This was a real strange setup that they had. The British had planned this thing and it, it didn't work too well anywhere except in the desert. And of course the desert war was over. So they went to Europe and had a retrain again as a medium tank battalion which they did, and the colonel got tired of training, so he wanted to go fight. So he finagled away for the unit to get to, to uh, Europe, and uh, no tanks were assigned, and even when they got to uh, New Chateau. So he reported into the First Army headquarters, and they chewed him out good because he wasn't supposed to be there. They said, we, we, would, we would send for you if we needed you. So he said, well, we want to fight. 
So uh, he said, well, they told us, well, you take over the town of New Chateau and keep law and order there and uh, keep training. We'll get you a couple of tanks. You can work training schedule out with a couple of tanks, which they did. Well, one, one night a guy was patrolling the town. Uh, the curfew was fairly early and uh, he saw a lady walking down the, down the road. He says, Madam, you're supposed to be home after curfew. And she says, I have to go to the hospital. Uh, and uh, he said, well, I said, I'm sorry, but you have to go home. She says, I have to go to the hospital. I said, open it up, she's very pregnant. So he took her to the hospital. Well, later on, fast forward to 1999, when we went over to set up a, a, our monument that we put in, uh, this lady stopped me and asked me if this particular guy was there. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll get him for you. He said, I don't know any, any women in Belgium. I said, well, she knows you. So he went over and met her and come find out the guy that was standing next to her was her son. And she had named him after this guy in our outfit. Really? And uh, luckily the guy didn't have his wife with him or it would have been <laughs> very hard to explain. <laughs> but anyway, we, we stayed there and then the Battle of the Bulge started on the 16th of December. And the 17th of December, they realized that this was getting serious. So they told us to go to this ordnance depot and take anything we wanted and uh, get ready to go in for the fight. Well, we went to the ordnance depot and everything that was there was junk. It had been beat up already, or had holes in it and everything else. Anything that was usable was pretty much in bad shape. So anyway, we put together three tanks and that's all we could put together from there. So they right away they ordered, ordered these three tanks down to the railroad station at the town of Stumont, Belgium. And meanwhile, the rest of the battalion was going around searching for other vehicles that we could get for the battalion. So anyway, they went down, this, there was a curved road going down by the train station. And as they came around, we always went around a curve very slow because you didn't know what was around there. So they went around, the, our first tank saw the lead first German tank of the SS, first SS Panzer Division, which was Hitler's elite. And they were a mean bunch of guys, they were. Anyway, our first tank fired and shell ricocheted off the road, went underneath the tank and hit the soft part of the tank, which is the bottom part, and knocked them out. And then he reloaded, our man reloaded, and the round got stuck, so he motioned for the next tank to come around. The second tank came around, he faced the second German tank. He fired and knocked the uh, muzzle brake off the, the, the main gun. The muzzle brake, of course, is out on the end, you know, it has, it keeps, the, it keeps the smoke from going straight out, it blows it to the side. Anyway, uh, he hit that tank and it stopped. They were useless from there on. And then the third tank came around in back of him and he caught the, uh, the, the third tank and he fired three rounds into him and knocked him out. And uh, that was in the first half hour of our unit being in the combat in, in the Battle of the Bulge, which was quite spectacular. And we got credit for stop, they called us the, the uh, cork to the, in the bottle, you know, that stopped them. Later on, of course, we, we uh, had more battle in, in the town of Stumont at a sanatorium there called St. Edward's. And uh, we went in there and uh, found, after we got the Germans out of it, uh, we found something like 50 uh, Belgian civilians and children in the, in the basement with a Catholic priest that was keeping them quiet, you know, because the Germans were in the building. They didn't know these people were in the basement. So we liberated them and, oh God, were they thankful. Oh, they were really thankful because they were scared to death. Anyway, we went on to the next town of Leglise and ran the Germans out of there. And uh, from then on, it was, oh, that was with the 30th Infantry Division. We, see, we, were, we were a separate battalion that they could attach us to any, any infantry division. That was with the 30th Division. Well, about that time, at Christmas, the 82nd Airborne came up. 101st went to Bastogne, 82nd came up to our, our, our area in the north. And uh, there's, there were three thrusts in the, bat, in the Battle of the Bulge. There's north thrust, the central, and the southern thrust. Well, Bastogne sat right here on the tip. We were right here on this northern shoulder. 
And so anyway, uh, we went with the 82nd Airborne, and then we really had some tough fights. They, those guys were fabulous. They, they were just great guys, and just not only was the unit fabulous, but they, they, the guys themselves were just individuals, great. And we were with them through the rest of the bulge. Then we went into across the uh, Siegfried line. Had a hell of a battle in the Siegfried line. The, the 82nd said it was the worst battle they had ever been in. So we had to take their word for it because they've got around a lot. So anyway, we we wiped out the area there. Very difficult. Uh, each each foot was a, a fight. Each foot of the area, and uh, we uh, got them cleaned out. That that area now is no longer there. It's a it's a it's a uh, a mine, a surface mine, whatever they call them. And the town was never rebuilt. It they just tore all the rest of it down and, and left it that way. And then after the uh, after the uh, Siegfried line fight, well, they we went into the to the town of Duren uh, on the west side of the Ruhr River, R O E R, is where we stopped because the Germans had flooded the Ruhr River. They had ruined the. Um, uh, my, uh, the uh, dam up the, up the river and the water flew, flew down there and for a two mile stretch we, you couldn't get across there because it was so muddy. So we had an artillery duel there and uh, all we did continually, every, all day long, pump artillery rounds into it and the Air Force came over and bombed it. But we finally got across the, the, the river, the river went down so we could get a bridge in there uh, and we got into Durham. And the funny thing there, there was a statue there of Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, he, he was pointing like this to the west with his arm down here like this. Well, all this bombing and the shelling had actually vibrated this thing so it was completely turned around. This time he was pointing to the east. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I went by that thing, I said, I bet you some GI is gonna knock the finger off of that statue. Well, I never knew what happened. In fact, I had forgotten about it. One day, just a few months ago, I was reading a magazine or something, and I saw a picture of this statue. But it was taken from this side, and I noticed that the arm wasn't there either. <laughs> Somebody knocked the whole arm off of it. Big souvenir. Yeah. Uh, but explain what it takes to get the upper hand. Is it just about superior firepower, or is there a lot of tactical ingenuity needed here? Well, at our level, of course, at battalion level, uh, we took orders from the infantry. Uh, if they wanted to push, we pushed. And uh, with the 82nd Airborne, it was continually pushed. And they, they were great guys, and, and uh, we were always on the push, continually push, push, push. We had a hell of a battle in the town of St. Vith, uh, which was equally as bad as the one at Bastogne, but at least we never got encircled, and we always liked the kid that went over first, but we never were encircled. We always did the encircling. But anyway, uh, we had a terrible battle there, and I was in the assault gun platoon of our battalion. And we were used uh, for th that very thing, uh, knocking down buildings and, and knocking down church steeples where, where uh, uh, snipers were. And they would, they would stop the infantry completely. So we'd get into town and they'd say, you see that church over there, there's a sniper up in the, in the belfry, uh, can you knock that off? So we'd, get it adjusted, we'd put a round up there and knock the top of the church off, and we'd get the, uh, the sniper. That was the only way you could get them out. Now the 1st SS Panzer Division that we faced was a, a mean division. Now they had been in Russia and they were called the Blowtorch Division because everything they saw they burnt down, and they loved to call fires. Uh, they were responsible for the uh, uh, Malmedy Massacre, uh, you might have heard of that, something like 90 some GIs were captured and shot down in cold blood. The, the first SS had a bad habit of, of doing that. They'd just go through a town and if people were just standing there watching them, but they'd turn a machine gun on them and shoot them down like dogs. And that's the kind of guys they were. So my particular part of it was, was uh, shoot, shooting these, these uh, assault guns at the, at the uh, SS. And the SS were, we, we never felt sorry for any of them. Now, the Wehrmacht, we, they were different. They were just draftees like everybody else. But, but the SS, they were just mean people. 
And that was kind of the thing that, that uh, I personally ran into. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a continual push. I mean, you never got a chance to sleep unless you were lucky. If you could, if your tank stopped, you'd be surprised how everybody would just sit there and all of a sudden you know, like that. And then somebody would have to stay awake to make sure that they can't take any radio messages for us to move. And so it was strictly push, 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 and sleep when you can and if you can. And eating was something else. I mean, you, didn't, you never know whether you're gonna eat or not. And it was uh, that kind of a situation always. One thing we didn't talk about when we were talking about the Battle of the Bulge, yeah, the cold. Oh, gosh, yes. It was very cold. It was the coldest winter that they had ever recorded in Belgium at that time. And uh, it was terribly cold. And a lot of the, a lot of the fellows, especially the 82nd Airborne, when they came up, they, a lot of them didn't even have winter clothing. They had just come out of uh, uh, Holland, you know, the bridge too far thing. Mm -hmm. They had just come back from there, and uh, they were refitting in France when they were called up. They got there, and uh, some of them were dressed just like this. They just had a shirt and pants on, and some of them had overcoats, some did not. Most, Some of them didn't even have rifles or, or weapons, so they had to pick them up where they could get them. But uh, they came in and filled in real well, and it was so cold. I, I remember one time I counted the number of different coats that I, I remember seeing at that time. And I had something like 20 military coats that people were wearing, different jackets and coats to keep warm. Did you have shelter? Did, did you have to stay No, the, the only the shelter street? we had was inside of a tank. And, and when it was moving, we had to keep the hatches open because uh, you couldn't see very well by looking through the periscopes, you know. And if you could keep your hatches open, you could, you could make sure nobody was, was uh, watching you that was gonna shoot at you. And uh, it was dangerous, but uh, it had to be done to keep from being knocked out because the tank was very vulnerable. And our tanks especially because the Germans had such a good gun on their tanks that, uh, that uh, you know, we were, we were really sitting ducks for them. Did your gas is, gasoline freeze at any point? Never had gasoline freeze, uh, uh, I suppose, because we kept the engines running as much as we could. Not only for warmth, but because we had to be on the go. Uh, I don't know whether the Germans had that problem or not, but they, they had uh, diesel engines on their tanks. We didn't get diesels until later on. Uh, we captured a, a uh, uh, Tiger Royal, a Mark VI tank, the only, uh, the only intact uh, Tiger VI that uh, we ever got in, in Europe, and they brought it back to the States. And that's a separate story by itself. And that, I, I wish I had the time to go through that. That, that, that is something. Is that still else. classified? No, it's not classified, not at all. Uh, uh, that CDL thing that I told you about earlier, it, that was a classified thing for years. And when we had our first reunion about uh, 50 years ago, uh, the guys thought that it was still classified and wouldn't talk about it even at the reunion. And I had to convince them. I said, look, that thing has been a long time unclassified. You can say anything you want to. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, okay, it was a German Tiger Royal, which is the biggest tank that the Germans had over there at that time. They had one other that it, there was only one or two of those there. But this was the biggest problem that we had there. Uh, a buddy of mine was riding down the road in his tank. He was a tank commander. And this was in some fire break in the Ardennes forest. I don't know where it was actually. But he was riding along and he came face to face with his Tiger Royal. Now this thing's got a 88 millimeter gun on it, you know, and, and it can blow a, a, a Sherman tank out of it. So anyway, he saw this thing and nothing happened. And he thought, well, maybe the crew is asleep in there. So he fired a star shell above the, above the German tank. And when it lit, well, the Germans bailed out, so I guess they thought it was on fire. So fortunately, he was up in the turret, and he had a 50 caliber machine gun, and he killed three of them, wounded one, and one got away. And so he radioed back, and he told the battalion commander, he says, uh, I got this uh, tire royal, and he says, I'm gonna drive this thing around here. Says, and the colonel said, no, get out of that thing. He says, some GI will see you, and he'll try to knock you out. And he said, no, I'm gonna drive this thing all the way to Berlin. He said, no, don't do that, get out of it. Well, he did it, he stayed in it till he ran out of fuel. So anyway, he radioed back, told the battalion commander where it was located. 
near the town of Coo, Belgium. I like that name, Coo, C-O-O. And uh, so the, the battalion commander told him, he says, well, I'm going to have ordnance come up and, uh, and uh, take this thing and bring it back to Aberdeen for, for testing because it's too good of a tank not to. So they went up the next day to ordnance when it came up. This is where I get mad. First thing they did, they painted their name, 423 Ordnance Evacuation Company, on the, on, about that wide on the tank. And they immediately uh, went over and, and had to try to get the tank loose. Well, it was frozen to the ground because they had to seal tracks. So they poured gasoline around the track, got it loose, and they brought up a, a, a flatbed tank retriever trailer for a Sherman tank and winched this German tank up on it. Well, of course, it stuck out on both sides about like that because their tracks were something like this and ours were about like that. And so they got it up there and they hauled it back to uh, Spa, Belgium, to the train station and uh, gave it to the, our colonel and he says, no, I want to send it on, on to uh, uh, the port so that they can send it back to the States. So there it was, had that marking on there. Our unit actually captured it, but here they had their name on it, see. Well, years passed and that tank sat at the uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground and uh, one day they decided they were all through testing it and everything about 30 day, years later and they sent it to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And Fort Knox, Kentucky got it and they cleaned it up, painted it beautifully, looked like it was right off the assembly line. They sawed off half of it so that you could see inside. And they had a plaque sitting in front of it and it said that it was captured by the 423rd Ordnance Evacuation Company. And I saw that and I about had a fit. So I ran into the office of the curator of the museum and I told him, I said, you got a mistake out there. I said, that, that tank was not captured. It was, number was 332. I've never forgotten tank number 332. And I said, 332 was captured by the 740th Tank Battalion. And I gave him the whole story and I gave him the name of the guy that had captured it. Oh, well, he said, these ordnance people said that they captured it. I said, were you ever in the army? And he says, no. I said, Ordnance never, I shouldn't, probably shouldn't say this, but I said, ordnance people never captured anything but a, a dose of VD at a rear area of brothel. And uh, I don't know whether that'll go over big on your radio or not, but that's actually what I said to him. Uh, and uh, so he said, well, if you can prove it to me, I'll, I'll change it. So I got a hold of the guy that actually captured it. And uh, I asked him to repeat the story so that I'd have it in his voice and I plugged him in so that he could say it on the telephone, you know, and I could record it. So he did it and I gave the uh, cassette to the curator there and he finally changed it. But he had already written an article and gave them credit for it and the article went all over the world. So it was never corrected. So that's been my, my uh, sole duty in life to get that straightened out. <laughs> Fascinating story. I love that story, and I'm glad it got corrected. <laughs> um, one of the things people, most people know, if they, if, they, if they know history pretty well, is that the Cold War started pretty soon after the end sure of the, the war in the European theater. Sure but there's a part to your story that shows just how soon it started. Uh, as soon as uh, victory was declared in Europe, you were sent to Denmark. Explain why. We were, we were sent to, uh, to the Baltic to stop the, the Russians from coming through to take Denmark. We were at the town of, of uh, oh gosh, well, it's up right on the right on the Baltic. There's a castle there. I've got it in my paperwork there, but I can't even remember the name of it. Anyway, we we stopped there, and that blocked the Russians from taking Denmark, and we didn't know why they had sent us up there for the longest time, and uh, it was just oh, probably ten years, ten fifteen years ago that we found out that we were there to stop the, the Russians from going over there. Now, while we were there in this town, there's a lake there, and uh, the Russians were on the other side of the lake, we were on the west side. And a couple of guys went over there, and the Russians were pretty nasty to us. But uh, there was some German that, that begged these two guys to let them hide on the boat that he had, they had rowed over, and they took him back over and set him free. Uh, he was very thankful. He wanted to get away from the Russians. But anyway, uh, yes, it, it, from then on, we went down to the American's occupation zone 
and took up our stations for occupation duty, and we were attached to the 3rd Infantry Division at that time. And our people had to uh, crawl up to the uh, guard post because the Russians were taking pot shots at them as they crawled up there. And so th that started it for us. And then, of course, it went from, uh, from there on up. And, you, of course, you heard about Winston Churchill in 1947 or 8, where he said the, from Stettin on the Baltic to Trieste on the Adriatic, Iron Curtain has descended. Well, it had descended actually before that, but I like the way he said it, and it was sure true. And we had nothing but problems with him uh, continually. And then, of course, uh, I was there when the, when the wall went up, and I was wall there before that uh, when just the fences were up, but they had mine, minefields on, on the east side. They were pretty pretty nasty people, and uh, if you got caught over there, you were in real trouble. So, so anyway, uh, Thank God I was able to get back over there when the wall came down too, and that made me very happy to see that, that it worked. The Germans were very happy about the whole thing. And we, 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 had a lot, we have a lot of friends that are Germans now that we never would have had otherwise. It's interesting, young people who don't remember what it was like with the wall have a hard time yeah, yeah, realizing just how big of an event that, that really was. We had people fly over. They built airplanes and flew over. How they ever got off the ground, we never could figure it out. But they flew, just flew over the fence. That's all they wanted to do to get out of there. And one one family uh, took their little car that they had and put a bunch of sheet iron on it and uh, drove through the fence. It made it look like a tank. And they, they drew through, drove through the fence before the wall went up. But after the wall went up, there was a lot of people that were killed trying to get up over it. It was a very sad thing. And I remember one time in Vienna, there was a GI that passed a, a Russian officer's club. And there was a Russian guard there, and the GI didn't know any better. He said, hi, Ruski. And this guy dropped his submachine gun on him. He shot him right there, and he died right there in the, in the gutter. They wouldn't let, let the MPs or the medics or anybody come over to him until he died. That never hit the newspapers in this country because I asked my sister to watch for it. And she said she never saw it. And that's the kind of stuff, and a lot of, a lot of this kind of stuff that happened that would never reach back home. I don't know whether they didn't want the people to know about it. I, I, I like to think that that was not the reason, but it might have been, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to know. Uh, I, I did promise our listeners that we would uh, get to your uh, service in, in the other conflicts. So you served in Europe till 1948, at which point you were sent to the Far East. Yeah, I went to, uh, I went to Japan and uh, got there in 48, and I was, at, I was supposed to go to the 1st Cavalry Division, and they asked me if I would want to go to MacArthur's headquarters. And I thought, oh boy, I won't have to sleep on the ground anymore, and might get some decent meals and have sheets to sleep in. And so I said, yeah, I'd like to go there. So I went to MacArthur's headquarters in Tokyo, Daiichi Building, which is still there, and uh, I was in the communication center. I had a, a portion of the communication center there that I was in charge of. And so they, anyway, they needed to set up a uh, alert, what they called alert crew, in case MacArthur ever wanted to go forward, which we kind of laughed because most people knew that MacArthur never went forward. Uh, but anyway, uh, we had to set this up, and uh, I was in charge of it. So meanwhile, we had to go and learn to take off and load take off and landing gliders, which uh, we did. And uh, I got my glider pins, and uh, that's a big hit with the 82nd Airborne, the fact that I've got that, because not many have it that weren't in an airborne unit. But anyway, uh, I took the training, and then when the Korean War started, why, uh, it was some time before MacArthur went over to Korea. But we had to go over a day or two in advance and set up communications, and he would come in and do his thing, and when he'd leave, well, we'd tear down communications and go back to Japan. Well, they had declared the gliders uh, obsolete right after our training, so we never had to use gliders, thank God. But we had to go in by airplane, and that wasn't too bad. And I never knew where we went, because, you know, we would land at an air base in Korea, and we'd set up somewhere wherever they told us to go. And we never really knew where we were except that we were in Korea. People have asked me, what, what town were you in? What area were you in? I have no idea. 
I really didn't want to know at that time anyway because uh -huh. I didn't think a whole lot of that country. Uh, I, I, love, I love the people now. Uh, and uh, then, too, I had nothing against them at all. But uh, it, it, was, it was quite different. It was quite a different war altogether. I heard you did try to get sent back there, though. I, I went back. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I tried to go back later on. I, I was put into the Army Security Agency. And I wanted out of it. I just, I just wanted out of it. I happened to be in an outfit that was about the sorriest outfit I'd ever been in in my life, and uh, I had a lot of personnel problems there, mostly with the officers. Uh, the troops didn't have any problems with. I was in charge of the troops, and of course the officers were supposed to set the example, and they didn't set a very good example. So anyway, I wanted out for that, for that reason. So my hitch came up, and. Uh, I, oh, I had volunteered to go back to Korea in the tanks. Oh, I was too essential. And I volunteered for the infantry. Oh, I was too essential. What it was was they had so much money put into my security clearances that they just didn't want to turn me loose. I, I, I found that out. Uh, but, you know, uh, anyway, that's the reason I got out of the Army. I went back home, got out of the Army, went to the Air Force, and asked them if they could use me. And they asked me what I did in the Army, and I told them that uh, in my communications work, they said, we'll take you. And I said, yeah, well, let's talk Frank. And they said, what was your rank in the Army? I said, uh, tech sergeant. And they said, we'll give you tech sergeant, but we can't give you the time and grade. So I said, I'll take it. And, and I spent the rest of my years in, in the Air Force. Best move I ever made. What, uh, we've just got a couple minutes left here. What were your main responsibilities with the Air Force? I, I was at the SAC headquarters and uh, uh, my duties were uh, codes for the for the aircraft. Uh, every every new mission had to have different codes because they didn't. For instance, they didn't want uh, a code used going to Vietnam uh, that you also used to to uh, alert the force or to to launch the force to go to say Russia or China or somebody like that, you know, or Cuba or whatever. And uh, so we had. This, to establish new codes for each each type of uh, new new uh, uh, program right, that they had, and uh, also I was in on some of the joint targeting stuff for for, uh, for SAC. But uh, uh, my main thing was was the codes for the for the bombers going to Vietnam, and I was mighty glad to see what some of the results were. Of, that they did over there because they did a good job. I've heard a lot of infantrymen saying they loved them the way they did it because they went in and just tore up a lot of real estate, you know. They changed some of the, just a couple of units they changed over from atomic bomb uh, racks in the airplanes to uh, hard, what we called iron bombs. And boy, when they went over and dropped these iron bombs, I mean, it looked like they were never gonna stop coming out. And uh, the GIs on the ground loved that and uh, I was kind of, kind of happy for them that I was able to help somewhat do that. I don't tell, a whole, tell them a whole lot about it because I figured they, they had it rougher than I did in that, in that war, but uh, I was very proud of it. Harry, just a minute or so left in our conversation. I've read where you've said, even more than 50 years after leaving uh, the military, that uh, you don't regret it for a moment and that uh, you absolutely loved serving our country. So oh, what, that's what are you very, most proud of? That's very, very, very true. And uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, when the Iraq store, Iraq war started, when the uh, desert storm, uh, I was walking down the street and I went by an Air Force recruiting office and I walked in and I walked up and I said, I do. And the guy looked at me and he said, I'm sorry. He said, but you're gonna have to get a facelift before I can take you. <laughs> I said, you dirty. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that, I, I really was serious. I would have gone back in in a minute. And I would have stayed in the service uh, longer than I did, but uh, I had two boys and uh, they were getting of age that I had to, had to have them back home. I had, had to be able to get, be back there with them because they were just starting to get of an age and I was worried about them. So that's the reason I got out and I would, I've been involved with the military as much as I could be ever since. I, I just love the military and the people in it. I think we've got the best. Harry, you are one of the best. Thank you. Well, for, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for your service, mostly, and uh, thank you for being with us today as well. well. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much.
Harry Miller, veteran of the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force, combat veteran of World War II, also served during the Korean and Vietnam Wars, 22 years total in uniform. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.